So let's get started with the skeletal system today. And um, first thing we'll take a look at is the different ways in which we can classify the bones of our skeleton. When we are fully formed, we have a total of 206 bones. But as a developing fetus, by the way, we actually have many more. So as we, as we finish forming our bones, some of those bones merge and we end up with just 206. And I apologize, I kind of used small font for my text for the slides, so that's another reason why it's so important for you guys to follow with your devices. Okay, so one way in which we can classify this big pile of 206 bones is to organize them according to what region they occur in. And so based on that, we have what we call the actual, actual skeleton, which forms pretty much the axis of the body, versus the appendicular skeleton, which is the skeleton that forms your appendages. So if we look at the figure that I have included, then all of the blue here represents the axial skeleton. Notice that these are the parts of the skeleton that kind of form the axis of the body. So if you look at which parts these are, then we have the skull. Oops, that arrow only goes in one direction. Huh? Then we have the skull. Let me switch uh, cursor. Let's do this. So we have, we have the skull. We have the vertebral column. And then we have the rib cage. All right. This is a, a question I've asked in the past. You know, I've asked students in, in the past what belongs to the axial skeleton. And um, often this question is missed. So be sure you know what belongs to the axial skeleton. So for instance, the, the scapulae and the clavicles or the pelvic bones, they do not belong to the axial skeleton. They belong to the appendicular skeleton. So be sure you know this. There's other ways to classify the bones. Um, you know, we human beings, we like to organize things. Have you ever noticed that when we're given a whole pile of stuff, one of the first things we have to do is kind of organize them into smaller piles so that the, it all makes much more sense to us. And we do that with the bones as well. So this time we're looking at the shape of the bones. And so we have a bunch of long bones, you know, the bones that we find in our lower limbs or in our upper limbs or even in our hands, a lot of those bones are long bones. You know, obvious name to give them. We also have a bunch of short bones. If we jump over here to the short bones, uh, short bones are found especially in your ankles. What do you call the ankle area? Tarsal area, right? And what do you call the wrist area? The carpal area, right? So be sure you don't forget which one is which. I always remember toes, therefore tarsal, TT. I do stupid stuff like that in my head all the time, but it helps me. I don't know if it will help you, uh, but that's how you can differentiate them. So they're called short bones because they are literally, um, you know, there's no length to them, uh, essentially. Then we have the flat bones. A lot of the bones in your skull, by the way, your cranial bones, the bones that form your cranium part of your skull, um, are considered flat bones. Again, classified flat because they look flat. Your sternum is another good example, um, your ribs, etc. And then there's a whole pile of bones we don't really know what to do with, and we'll just give them, uh, we'll just put them in a pile called the irregular bones. Your vertebrae are a good example. Even your pelvic bones go in that pile as well and a few more. Now, your book and, and other books actually often talk also about these so-called sesamoid bones, which are tiny little bones that um, vary between humans. So some of us have more of them, some of, them, some of us have less of them and, and in different areas. The only one that is consistent amongst all of us is the patella or the kneecap, which they have illustrated here. So a sesamoid bone is a bone that tends to protect your muscles and tendons from, uh, from rubbing against um, other bone uh, tissue. So read a little bit more about that in your book. Functions of bone, pretty straightforward. Clearly your bones protect you, but not so much all bones. We're talking particularly the bones that protect your skull and your, your spinal cord, right? So your skull bones and your vertebral column uh, protects your spinal cord. And then your rib cage, of course, protects your heart and lungs, things like that. 
your pelvic girdle protects especially those reproductive structures, right? But if you think of the bones that form, most of the bones that form your appendages, they don't really provide protection, do they now? What do they, what is their function primarily? Yeah. Right, they form anchor points for the muscles, right? So that the muscles have something to pull on and create movement. Do you see the difference between protection versus uh, movement? Clearly our bones are stuffed with minerals and what are the most important minerals or the most common minerals that we find in bone? Calcium, Calcium and? Phosphorus. Phosphorus, right? Which occurs in the form of phosphate. Very good. And then let's not forget that sodium, potassium, magnesium, and so on are also found in our bones. But calcium and, and phosphate, actually they form these little salt crystals that we'll learn more about. Um, so lots of mineral storage, but also storage of fat tissue, adipose tissue. So especially in the long bones, which have a cavity on the inside to make, make sure they stay light, because just think if your bones, your long bones were solid, you know, it would be really hard to keep moving. Um, you want them hollow so they have some lightness. So that those cavities, which we'll give a name here very soon, are typically filled with yellow bone marrow, unless we're dealing with a young child. And in that case, we might still see some red bone marrow. So in, in children, we see a lot more red bone marrow because they're still growing. They're still going through lots of cell division, cranking out a lot of blood cells, etc. cetera. Um, but in, in all of us, for instance, who are in the room here, we have in those long uh, cavities of the long bones, primarily yellow bone marrow. And don't forget that um, the red bone marrow is the area where hematopoiesis occurs, right? Which is a term you've already learned about. Any questions so far? Pretty straightforward, right? Here's an image that I'd like for you to use to remind yourself of the different locations of cartilage. We can't really have a good conversation about the skeletal system and the bone tissues unless you keep in mind the, the cartilages. Um, for one, the cartilages are part of the skeleton. They provide some uh, form of, of um, a structure and shape to the body, depending on shock absorption. It depends on where they are. So don't forget what kinds of cartilage tissues, where they're located, and also their interesting features, such as the lacunae and the fact that they all have collagen fibers, but in some of the cartilages, we don't see it in the, in the microscope slides. Uh, see them, I should say. And for instance, an elastic cartilage, we see the elastic fibers the best. Cartilages, by the way, are also very rich in water. I'm going to turn my iPad so that this whole, oh, I can't do that with the software, that's right. Well, we'll have to do it this way. So what we'll do next then is focus on the gross anatomy of a, a long bone. And we'll do that a little bit with flat, a flat bone as well. And that's pretty much where we will leave it when it comes to studying the different uh, shapes of bones. So once you understand these two, the irregular and the short bones are very similar to uh, these two, especially the irregular and short bones look like, uh, often like the flat bones. So in the case of a long bone, we have some major regions uh, with which we give specific names. So let's get, get going on that. So the bone that we're looking at right here, does anybody happen to know which bone that might be? Femur. It's a femur. Very good. Your thigh bone, right? So this long shaft, as we would refer to this in, in plain old English, we give a scientific name of the diaphysis the diaphysis. Can you guys read that way back there? Probably not. Uh, so again, bring your devices so you can read this a little bit better. Now these knobs at the end, or we call them often these extremities, these we refer to as the epiphyses. And that's the plural version. So we have one epiphysis, and then we have two epiphyses. And so depending on which epiphysis we're talking about, we might call it the proximal versus the distal epiphysis, depending on what end of the bone it is located on. Now there's a, a rather small region that sits sort of in between the diaphysis 
and the epiphysis, and that is called the metaphysis or metaphysis. Um, this is going to be especially an area that we'll bring up when we talk about the growth plate, which we will actually refer to as the epiphysial plate as we get to it. All right, so the metaph metaphysis is the area where we would expect to find the growth plate. Mind you, do we have a growth plate or an epiphysial plate in a growing, in an adult bone, I should say, in a bone that's finished growing? No. All right, so we'll, we'll see what happens to that epiphysial plate. Now, like I said, the inside of these long bones is hollow, and we refer to that cavity since it sits in the very core of the bone as the medullary cavity. Remember medullary or medulla always refers to the very inside, like you had a medulla of the hair follicle. Remember that? Which then on top of it had a cortex. And as a matter of fact, where it is labeled here compact bone, which is the outer layer of bone tissue that essentially holds up the diaphysis, we can refer to that as, I might as well write this down for you guys, um, we can refer to this as the bone color or even the cortex, color as in C-O-L-L-A-R, or the cortex, you'll see that at times too. Let me choose another color that's a little light, isn't it? Let's choose red, okay. Let's move on to the next slide. And on the left-hand side, you see that long bone uh, reminding you that blood, I'm sorry, that bone is very vascularized. Not only that, bone also has nerve vessels and lymphatic vessels. You know, we tend to think of bones as these dead things inside of us, because that's typically what we see, you know, that's, I mean, that's what we have seen when, we're, when we've seen bones lying around, maybe, you know, in a ditch somewhere, the skull of a cow, sometimes you see that, um, or you've learned, you've studied bones in the past, um, you know, they're not live anymore. But bear in mind that there's quite a bit of vascularization. And I'm not going to hold you responsible for the name of all these arteries and veins, except for this one right here, which is your... Um, nutrient arteries and veins, artery and veins, which enter the diaphysis pretty much uh, right in the center of the diaphysis. So I'd like for you to be aware of that. So let's focus on the figure on the very right here to add a little bit more terminology. And maybe what I ought to do is blow this up a little bit. So there we go. So we can focus on that part for now. So the epiphyses are going to be pretty rich in spongy bone tissue. Remember, there are two types of bone tissue. There is compact bone tissue and spongy bone tissue. We find compact bone tissue to form the bone color or the cortex of the diaphysis, while the majority of the epiphysis is spongy bone tissue. But we have some compact bone tissue at the periphery as well, just to give it some more strength. The end of the long bone is going to be covered with that hyaline cartilage, which we refer to as, I should say, that layer we call the articular cartilage. And what is, why is it called articular cartilage? What is it implying that's happening there? What do we mean by articular? What does to articulate mean? Movement. movement, right. So this is where an articulation is a, is a joint. So an articular cartilage is where there is a joint. A joint can also be called articulation, by the way. I'm going to abbreviate that. There you go. Now notice that they mention here epiphyseal line. And the epiphyseal line, which we see right about here, in this case, is the remnant of the epiphyseal plate. What is the epiphyseal plate again? In English terms? 
the growth plate, right? When we have stopped growing, that growth plate, which by the way is made up of hyaline cartilage, disappears and instead it becomes a line. So the fact that you see a line tells you this bone has stopped growing. Okay, now if we bring this back to its original size, what we're going to do next then is focus on the membranes that we find inside of the bone and on the outside of the bone. And they're called periosteum and endosteum. So I want to give you a little bit of a preview. So on top of the bone collar, we're going to see the periosteum. It will not cover the articular cartilages though. The articular cartilages are not going to be covered. But the periosteum sits on the outside of the diaphysis. And then lining the medullary cavity and lining all these holes here in the spongy bone tissue, there we're going to have another membrane called the endosteum. So here we see them listed, the two membranes. We have the periosteum and we have the endosteum. And if you listen to their names, you know, they tell you where they are located. Periosteum, around the bone, right? Endosteum, inside of the bone, all right? Try to always understand what these new terms mean. If you need to get online and figure out the Latin or Greek root, you should do that. If I remember correctly, I provided you with all kinds of Latin roots um, under extra resources or so as well. But you can just dig around on the internet. It'll make your life so much simpler in this class if you just know some of these Latin and Greek roots. So just to give you a little bit of a preview, your periosteum is going to cover most of the diaphysis and it consists of two sublayers. So the periosteum is pretty thick. And the outer layer has a bunch of fibers in it. As a matter of fact, it's, it's kind of a dense regular to dense irregular connective tissue. It's vascularized, it's innervated, and it provides some protection. But the inner layer, the layer that actually touches the bone itself, is just a bunch of cells, a bunch of bone cells, which we haven't said a whole lot about yet. And therefore, we refer it to, to this layer as the osteogenic layer. You'll find out here in just a second why it's called osteogenic layer. But the, the bone type, the bone cell types that we find in there, we're going to keep coming back to these over and over and over again, are the osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts. Your osteoblasts are your bone builders. Your osteoclasts, on the other hand, they break down bone tissue. And the way I remember that the osteoclasts break down bone tissue is because osteoclasts have that k k sound and break down. That's how I do it. Again, that work, that's what works for me. I don't know if that will work for you. Your osteoblasts build. And then your osteoprogenitor cells are stem cells for the osteoblasts. And we will look at that again. So if you haven't quite gotten everything I just said about these cells, no worries. We will talk about these cells until you're sick of them. We'll mention Sharpie's fibers in just a little bit. Notice that, um, oh, by the way, so why do we refer to that inner layer as the osteogenic layer? Well, if this is the layer, or if this layer contains such, such cells as osteoblasts, which can build bone tissue, we're clearly capable, with the help of this layer, of generating new bone tissue. So from there, the term osteogenic layer. Remember, genesis means creation, making of, generating, basically. Now the endosteum you're going to find lining the medullary cavity, but also other things. And you'll see that the bones are full of holes and canals. We'll talk about what the trabeculae are in just a little bit. Those are found in spongy bone tissue. And the endosteum is similar to the inner osteogenic layer of the periosteum. So it's again also made up of these bone cells we just listed, just not very organized. It's just sort of a bunch of cells sitting around, maybe some fibers, but really not a whole lot. It's primarily just cells. 
Now take a closer look at what this is like on, on a diagram. And let's say that we take a chunk out of the bone organ right here and blow that up. Then here we see the periosteum in greater detail. And so this outer layer, oops, this outer layer is going to be the periosteum, the periosteum's fibrous layer. While we have an inner layer, which is mostly cells. And, and you're going to see this a little bit better in just a moment. This whole periosteum is actually attached to the actual bone tissue with collagen fibers, which we refer to as Sharpies fibers. You'll see that label uh, coming up here, or you might have already seen it in a previous image. So let's get, go back to the original size of the picture and now zoom into an area that is more in the um, spongy bone tissue. So here we are in the spongy bone tissue area of an epiphysis. And we'll understand all of this stuff here better, you guys, in just a little while. But what we need to focus on is the endosteum. So the endosteum, it lines the medullary cavity as well, so the inside of the medullary cavity. But it also lines all of the holes that you see in the spongy bone tissue. And even though it doesn't seem like we're looking at a hole, right here would be a hole. You know, you can only create holes if there's walls of some sort. So this is the wall of the hole. And this is where all of these cells are that we just listed. Anywhere from osteoblasts to the big beasts, these are your osteoclasts. Your osteoclasts, remember they break down bone tissue, and so they're more like macrophages. They're always like, where's that bone tissue? I'm going to chew it up, right? So we'll learn more about that. So those are your two layers. Now, those bone membranes, or two bone layers, I should call them bone membranes, really, play a very important role all throughout life. Because they have the bone building cells and because they have the bone breaking down cells, we depend on them to make our bones in the fetus. We depend on them to lengthen our bones and to sicken our bones as we grow as children. We depend on them as we remodel our bones throughout the rest of our lives. As a matter of fact, when you're sitting there in your chairs not doing a whole lot, your bone tissue is very busy. It's munching away a little bit here, it's depositing a little bit there. And overall, you know, as healthy adults, um, overall the ratio of bone deposit and bone reabsorption is pretty much the same. So your bone mass typically doesn't change much. Unless, you know, tomorrow you start going to the gym and, w and start lifting weights like a maniac for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. You're going to grow thicker, heavier bones and therefore your bone mass will increase. Okay, so now we're looking at a flat bone. We only have six more minutes to go, you guys. I know you're tired after a test, but hang in there. So a flat bone we find especially in, in the cranial area of the skull. Your sternum is an example of a flat bone. And I always like to describe a flat bone as uh, a Swiss cheese sandwich. So you have this big slab of, or thick slab, I should say, of Swiss cheese, which is the spongy bone tissue area right here with all the holes in it, right? And then we have the compact bone tissue here. These are your pieces of bread. Okay, so you have spongy t bone tissue squeezed in between two layers of compact bone tissue. Now, on top of that compact bone tissue in a living bone, what else do you think you'll find there? A bone membrane called on top of here and on top of there. Just like we saw on a long bone, what is that bone membrane called? The periosteum, right? So imagine that on top of this compact bone layer here and there, you would also have a periosteum. Let's take a quick look, a closer look at the spongy bone. 
so that you start to be able to visualize it a little bit better. You can clearly see all the holes in it, but what creates those holes? So let's see what that looks like. So this is kind of a high magnification of spongy bone tissue. And, you know, we now see all the holes. And all of those holes are lined with endosteum. So if I were to draw the endosteum without glasses, we would be kind of like right here. How did I do? Kind of a thin pen, but here, I'll make it thicker. How's that? Right? So that would be where you'd find endosteum, lining all of these openings. Now, what makes the openings is the trabeculae. And the trabeculae are all of these struts. So all of these beams or struts, whatever you want to call them, the hard part of the spongy bone tissue, we call trabeculae. And I'll spell that for you. Trabeculae. Lee. That would be plural or singular? Can you guys read that? It'll be written out for you on other slides. That's plural. So singular would be trabecula. All right. So all of these trabeculae are covered with the, with the endosteum, or you could say the cavities are lined with the endosteum. Okay. Let's go back to the original size of the picture so that we're not lost with lost in where we are, so we just looked at what the anatomy is of a typical flat bone. Now, we just saw spongy bone tissue in this flat bone. Often, the spongy bone tissue in flat bone gets a unique name, and it's referred to as diploe. Diploe. Now, just to give you a little heads up, you guys, and let me just wrap this up and then I'll let you guys go. When I, when I uploaded your assignments for the skeletal system, Blackboard and the software that I used had a bit of a hiccup when I used an umlaut like that on top of the letter E, but that's how you spell diploe. So I tried to fix for the mo most of the questions, but on occasion it might start with the diplo and then throw some weird symbol in but I think you'll be able to recognize it, okay? At any rate, so the diploe, or diploe is another name for the spongy bone tissue in flat bones, all right? In flat skull bones, more specifically. Now, this slide focuses on locations for red bone marrow. In children, as I said earlier, we find lots of red bone marrow. In children, we even find red bone marrow in the medullary cavities. Remember what the medullary cavities are? The cavities in the, in the diaphysis and the shaft of the long bones, right? Your long bones have to be hollow, that hollowness. And you and I is filled with yellow bone marrow, fat tissue. But in growing children, we still see a lot of red bone marrow there. Other areas for red bone marrow in all of us, not just children, is in the spongy bone tissue of our skull bone, such as better called the diploe, and the extremities of some of our major bones, such as the femurs and the humerus. What is the humerus? Your arm bone, right? Notice how you spell it. There's no O in there, right? Because that would be being funny, right? So be careful. Your sternum has um, red bone marrow. Your vertebrae has red bone, have red bone marrow as well. Okay, we're a little bit behind the other class, but that's okay. So I'm going to stop here. This is kind of a good stopping point. This is one question or one favorite.